Praise God for those who have taken up that cause and we get to participate in it. And in this series where we're talking about what the church is, it's about giving ourselves away to others the way that Christ has given himself to us. And, and we're fortunate uh, that we're part of a bigger picture than just what's happening here at our local context, but we can be part of a global movement to relieve suffering around. Jesus said if we even give a cup of cold water in his name that he takes note of it and we will be rewarded for it. And so anything that you can contribute, whether it's in dollars, in prayer, and, and I'm going to embarrass her right now, but Shelly Walsh, would you even stand real quick so we can see who our MAP representative is? I want you to see Shelly because I want you to know that we have someone here who's taken up this cause and is helping lead the way. And so I want you to, if you're interested, to see her and talk to her uh, today even about ways that you can help beyond just going to this link in this website and potentially giving some money, but how you can pray for what's happening here in the, our local context even. And, and that's what it means to participate in the body of Christ. You know, right before I, I came up here, uh, I, I wanted to make mention of one more thing as well, uh, just to to help us see a bigger picture with little decisions that we make. It's the little things day by day that we do that over the long run can have a big impact. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of, of things that this church is producing right now. And one of, of the things that we have an impact on the most is obviously people. And, and one uh, person that we have is a young woman by the name of Lindsay Murphy. And, and Lindsay doesn't know I was going to do this. I'm going to embarrass her right now. Uh, you know, you all, Lindsay's been here for a long time, and you've all had a role in helping shape her spiritually and helping her know the love of God and see the love of God. And, uh, and yesterday she spoke at a large women's conference on our district with over a thousand women. I heard the Holy Spirit of God was just moving through you, so I just wanted to, in the, what, what better time than in a series on church than to say, praise God, that God is continually sending people out of here because of your faithfulness, because you have a role. And you see, you don't know what you're doing when you find a place to serve. You have no idea who it is that uh, you're impacting. And it can seem sometimes so mundane. And it can seem sometimes like we're not really making any big difference. But, you know, think about if you were Billy Graham's Sunday school teacher. She was in this small country church with probably five kids in her class. And she never knew that faithfully showing up week after week and teaching about Jesus Christ and his love for the world that her faithfulness would have such a huge impact on the world. And that's what Reimagining Church is all about. That's what this series is all about. It's about going from just being consumers with a consumer mindset that comes into the church only thinking about what's in it for me. Only thinking about uh, things that have no necessarily eternal impact uh, to a place where we understand that we are to imitate Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit of God coming into our lives is to make us more like Jesus. And Jesus is all about serving people to the glory of God. We sang a song there in our worship time. I want to see you, God. I want to see your glory. You know how God is seen? When the Holy Spirit inside of somebody allows his leadership to be embodied in them. When you and I literally become the image in the way that we talk, in the way that we act, in the way that we serve. You and I are the embodiment of Christ. You and I are the hope of the world. If you and I are not going to allow the Holy Spirit of God in us to turn us into humble servants for other people, there is no hope for God to be seen on the earth. We are God's instrument of being seen. And so we've been talking even about how the word church can be so misleading. You talk about church today, every person will tell you, oh, it's, it's a building. It's a gathering just on Sunday mornings. But you know what? 
the church in the Greek, it, it really helps us understand what church is all about. The, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, and it literally means the called out ones. The people called out from the world unto Jesus Christ to be his servants. That's the whole point of church. We're, we're here for a reason. It's not business networking, and it's not just for us to get what something good for ourselves. We're here because Jesus is calling us out to be his servants to one another and from one another out into the world. To build each other up and carry each other's burdens and encourage one another in such a way that we would be filled up with the love of God. That we would just carry that out with us into the world. And if we're not loving each other and encouraging each other and building each other up and carrying each other's burdens we're going to be in a pretty dry and empty place. And we're not going to have much to offer the world. In fact, what are we inviting them into? Are they getting called out from the world into a place that's negative and discouraging and backbiting and completely non-committal and non-devoted to each other? How many new Christians have to come in and go, man, I wish I had friendships like I used to have in the world. Remember the program Cheers? How many of you are old enough to remember the program Cheers? <laughs> you want to go where everybody knows your name? <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Dave Crowder's a big fan. Who knew? Who knew? The called out ones called out to serve Christ by serving one another, that we would be filled up to all the fullness of God and, and have something to offer the world, to invite them into, to call them out from where they are, to be fully known and fully loved into Christ-likeness themselves. And today, we want to look at what kingdom leadership is all about and, and understanding that by me calling you to a certain level of responsibility, by me calling you through the word of God to say, hey, you have a part to play here and you need to get busy playing it, that if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, he's given you a gift that the body needs for it to be a full picture of Christ. And if you're not participating, then we're missing it. It's incumbent upon me to tell you what Jesus said about you taking him on that responsibility. That that responsibility comes with a cost. So when I talk about kingdom leadership, I'm not just talking about pastors in title. I'm talking about anyone who has the courage to accept the call, to take responsibility for God's people and lost people around them. So with that being said, I want you to read with me in Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 17 and reading through to verse 28. And, I, and if you're struggling today, this ought to encourage you. Because here's some guys that have been following Jesus for three years, and they don't get it. And it's hard to believe for me sometimes when I read this and think, man, if I could walk with Jesus in the flesh, surely... I would get it. But these guys weren't getting it. Read with me now. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. And on the way, he took his 12 aside and he says to them, We're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They're going to condemn me to death. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised to life. Now, after hearing that, look at the next scene. <laughs> then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked to favor him, What is it that you want? He asked. Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? 
We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, that is a word for unbelievers, they lord it over people. And their high officials, they exercise authority over them. But that is not to be the case with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. That's a word, isn't it? That's sobering. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, it's certainly easy to understand why this mom would come to Jesus and want her two sons to be in a place of great influence and authority. You know, she and the disciples are continually picturing the Messiah as a conquering king. They are convinced that he's going to walk into Jerusalem and he's going to overthrow the Romans and he's going to throw his weight around and he's going to take all over the throne and they get to be there with him to just soak in all the glory over all their enemies. And so it isn't any wonder that the mother would come and say, hey, I want my sons to be the chief among your followers. I want them to be in preeminent positions of authority. Despite Jesus talking about his coming suffering, they could only understand the Messiah in this one way. And oftentimes that's the way that we picture as Christians it is to follow Jesus still today. If you follow Christianity at all in America, you know that there's a large audience for what is called prosperity preaching. Come to Jesus, and things will go really well for you. Come to Jesus, and if you just have a positive attitude, you'll have all your problems fixed and worked out. He wants you to be in a preeminent place in life. He doesn't want you to suffer in any way like he did. And all of us, certainly, we can identify ourselves in this story if we're honest. We all want to be in a preeminent position, sitting next to Jesus. And if you've received Jesus into your life and you have the Holy Spirit, you really are in a preeminent place. But it doesn't look like world's leadership looks. It looks like coming under people humbly to serve them, not trying to rule over them and force them into our own will and desire. Jesus, make my sons chief among your followers. And what is Jesus' response? You don't know what you're asking. <laughs> if you only knew what you're asking, I don't think you'd be asking it as a mother. See, because leadership in my kingdom to come under people, it comes with a level of suffering. Can you drink the cup that I'm about to, to drink? Do you not see or hear the words coming out of my mouth when I'm telling you that I came to serve and to suffer for the sins of the world? Mom, you're asking your boys to sign up for suffering to come and serve me on some level. I know you're asking for them to have respect and status and all the benefits that come with leadership, but James, John, you and me, we want the perks, but are we willing to handle the suffering that comes as well? See, because... The cup that Jesus was talking about, we have to remember that it was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, where we read this. Jesus, he was despised and rejected. He was despised and rejected. He was a man of suffering. 
He was familiar with pain. He was like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, held in low esteem. Surely, though, in doing that, he took up our pain and bore our suffering. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. I'm telling you today, church, if you're going to sign up to serve in God's kingdom, you're signing up to be bruised in some ways, as Jesus was bruised. And the reason that so many people often are not engaged in service in the church is because they understand it does come with a level of pain. Because, you know why? You're working with sinners like you. And we're all in process. And we all have blind spots. And we can all bruise each other pretty good. See, the cup that Jesus is talking about and what kingdom leadership is really all about is serving others even while suffering wrong from them. James, John, can you drink that cup? And of course, we know through church history that they did as James ended up a martyr for the faith and John was cast out to the island of Patmos and his life was martyrdom. And if, his, if their mom could only see what she was asking Jesus for, would she have still gone and said, hey, can my boys be a preeminent position in your kingdom? Well, they can if they can drink my cup. And I just love that Jesus, he's not a slick salesman. He's not a bait and switch kind of guy. He's just straight up honest. And he says, listen, it's going to come with a level of pain. It's going to come with a level of suffering. I mean, just consider Jesus with his own disciples here in this story and the emotional suffering he's experienced right now that at least I know for me what would be very irritating and tempting to want to yell at them for. He's telling his disciples that he's poured himself into for three years that he's about to suffer. He's about to be turned over. And their response is, hey, can we get back to us now and talk about our positions for a second in your kingdom? Cannot we relate to that? Here's James and John and their mom, and they have a private alliance that they've formed to try to figure out how they can rule over the others in a way that they want. They tried to go around the group to play over the group, and of course, then the other ten disciples, they're greatly displeased because they wanted to be the greatest. Do you see the toxicity right here in this story between the competition, the coercion that's going on right before Jesus? And if not for Jesus' intervention, it could have destroyed the whole group right here. And Jesus has to remind them, hey, hey guys, you've been watching me for three years and you're still not getting it. To be great in my kingdom, it's not like being great in this world, in this world's system. To be great in my kingdom, you've got to lose your life for the sake of others. You can't hold on to your own comfort. You can't hold on in playing it safe where you just sit on the sidelines, not engaged because getting engaged causes some pain. Yes, it does. And you know what? I do some of my best work in the middle of that pain. We got to remember from this story that Jesus is not just existing for our happiness. He is truly existing for our holiness. And what we mean by that is Christ-like character and shaping and molding. And you see, kingdom leadership, it's not just you shaping other people. It's other people shaping you in return at the same time. And you will always actually get more out of serving others than they will ever get out of you. Jesus asked us today, will you drink my cup? Will you serve others knowing that there is pain involved in the sacrifice on some level? Of course, there's great fulfillment too when you see God use you. But let's not pretend 
that there's not also a level of pain. I love what the Believer's Bible Commentary says as I read uh, in regards to this story. It says, You cannot have a crown without a cross, a throne without the altar of sacrifice. You can't have glory without suffering as Christ suffered for this world. If you're going to get engaged in serving people in the church and out of the church, you're going to suffer on some level. How many of you know this world, if you go out witnessing today, you're probably going to get some emotional suffering involved. People are going to call you stupid, naive, rude things. Not everybody's going to fall on their face and repent. I don't know why we look at things from, from the lens of our Western freedoms that we're so blessed to have, but when we read the Bible, what we read throughout the New Testament is a continual fight that there's principalities and powers of darkness at work, that there's really spiritual warfare going on, and if you're going to get in the game, you've you got to fight on your hands. You've got an enemy that's coming after you to discourage you, to get you to throw in the towel and say, it's not worth it. God's not worth it. It's too hard. It's too painful. Just give up. Because no matter what good comes, there's always going to be some level of resistance. Jesus says, do you want to be great? Don't come, don't run from the challenges that come with serving me. And there will be challenges. And if we're going to hang in there, we're not going to lose heart, and we're going to drink the cup that Jesus drank... I want to remind us of two truths that are very important that I think will build endurance and keep us hanging in there when the pain comes. First thing I want to point out, if you want to take notes, you put this on the back of your guide. And I got this from a person in our church, and remain anonymous, they know who gave me this line. It's a great line. And I got it just recently, and you know who you are. I just want to thank you for this point that I'm about to add. God never wastes a crisis. God never wastes a crisis. Look at what James says. Chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. How many? There's many kinds. <laughs> there's many flavors, like Baskin Robbins of trials. Amen? Because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces something in you. It produces perseverance. Your faith is tested in that moment. Is Jesus worth it still? When you got a drink from his cup, and it, it pales in comparison. It's almost silly to act like it's any kind of cup compared to his cup. But there's a cup to drink. And you're going to be tested in his service to say, is Jesus really Lord, and is he worth you getting up again and fighting another day for him? And it better be about him or you're going to be out of here. And just know that the testing of your faith, it not only produces perseverance, if you'll let perseverance finish its good work, if you'll keep getting back up again, if you'll keep fighting the good fight of faith, if you won't throw in the towel, if you won't lose heart, you will be complete, lack, not lacking anything in service to our Lord because Jesus never lets a crisis go to waste. He will form you into a new level of self-awareness and humility and dependence. Nothing builds a prayer life like trials. <laughs> Nothing brings humility like the understanding that I can't handle this. That's a horrible feeling and a really good thing for us. And I'm still getting amens. And I say praise the Lord for that. We have to trust the sovereignty of God to bring people along so that we don't have to feel ourselves that we have to punish them when they're not doing what we want them to do, just like disciples James and John here with Jesus. We got to trust that Jesus will get them there. Jesus got James and John where they needed to be, where they were willing to take the cup. 
And in the process of working with people in leadership and taking responsibility, there's a level of pain in that process. But God will use you, and he will form you in the process of using you if you're willing. Look at what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 and 11 says. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their father? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You can let pain train you, or you can let pain get you bitter. But if you will let pain train you in godliness, hey, how many of you know it's not pleasant while you're going through it? Can you get an amen? Like, joy is a choice you have to make sometimes, because sometimes when you're in a pain, you don't feel like praising God. But if you will hold to the word of God, you can actually praise him even in your pain, because you can know that he's training you by it. And he's going to make you complete because of it. And if your goal is to honor God the Father, then you can do what James says and rejoice even in the trials and the pains of life. And if you're going to be in leadership in the kingdom, you better believe God needs to shape you into Christ's likeness, which means God's going to have to work some trials into your life. But he sets the parameters, and he will not, you can know that anything that comes into your life as a a child of God, God allowed it to come. Because God wants holiness over happiness. He wants Christ's likeness over your self-centered ways. And the question again that Jesus looked at Peter and he said, I'm going to build my church on this conviction. Who do you say that I am? Am I the son of the living God? Am I worth it? Because if you're building your life on any other foundation but Jesus Christ, you will fall away. The second thing we need to keep before us in order not to lose heart Number one, remembering God never raised a crisis. God uses every child trial. The second thing we need to keep before us in order not to lose heart, the Lord will reward our perseverance and faithfulness. He will reward it. We've got to know that. Ephesians 6, 7, and 8, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not who? People. You know, you don't have to even like somebody to love them. Did you know that? I don't think we know that. Because we talk about falling into love and falling out of love. Like love is something we tripped into and then we tripped out of it. But biblical love is a choice that we make whether we like somebody or not. And it's a choice to put their best interest in mind even when they're not keeping our best interest in mind. And that's the cup of suffering that comes with kingdom leadership. That's Jesus hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. God will reward it, for God is not unjust. He will not forget our work and the love we've shown him as we have helped his people and continue to help them. God will not forget. God will not overlook. People may overlook you. People that you help will overlook the good that you do at times, but God will never forget And God will never overlook. God will reward if you'll hold on and you'll keep fighting the good fight of faith. And that's what kingdom leadership requires, is for you to keep that perspective, that big picture perspective, that if you'll just hold on, it'll all be worth it in the end. Guess what? The church life, just like every other place where people gather, it can be messy. And we can get indignant and self-righteous and say to ourselves, well, I'm just not going to serve because it's messy. You can do that. You don't have to drink the cup that Jesus drank. It's okay. You don't have to. But if you want to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be great, you got to drink the cup. Because the greatest among you will be the servant of all, Jesus called them together as he's called us together right now. And he says, if you want to be great, you've got to become a servant. 
If you want to be first, you got to be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. He gave his life, despite the fact that he was a man of rejection and sorrow, who was bruised for our iniquities. He still gave. And that's the life that we're to imitate to each other and to our world, that we're still willing to give, even though they don't want us, they're going to reject us, there's going to be some people that grasp on, that are in the kingdom, because somebody said yes to Jesus and his cup, despite the cost. And it'll all be worth it in the end. And I can tell you, when you stand, if you get to heaven one day, and you look at James and John, they will say, it was all worth. It was all worth. Would you um, stand with me right now? And I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. So Paul said, have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus our Lord who made himself nothing taking on the form of a servant. Is that your mindset today? I am nothing but God still loves me and came to rescue me. I don't deserve it but he still wants to use me. What's your mindset today towards church? What's your mindset today towards service? Would you believe that Jesus Christ could revive your heart if you're struggling today? Would you set your eyes on him, the author and the person? Would you remember that pain is a megaphone that God wants to drive us deep into him? That it was likely James and John's pain that got him off of that pedestal that said, we want to be the greatest to the place of humble desperation that empowered them in the spirit to become truly great in usefulness to our king. Heavenly Father, would you lead us today in repentance where we need it? Would you lead me personally in repentance where I need it, Lord? We need to renew our minds daily to think correctly as humble servants. Not here for our name and any title that we can get and what's in it for us. Lord, would you help us to ask, what's in it for Jesus? What's in it for you? Would you help us to make it all about you, God? Would you help us with our insecurities and such clear understanding that we we really in and of ourselves, we have nothing, but that if we would step out in faith and obedience to you to serve, that you would meet us there and you would empower us there. That you could actually use our brokenness as one of the greatest tools to help others be healed. So God, help us to be prepared to give reason for the hope that we have in you. And help us to serve not people, but really you. And in serving you then people. Because, Lord, we all come a little bit messy, challenging, and we need a lot of help, God. And we thank you that you're patient and long-suffering and making us more like you. So, Lord, help us to want to be great in your kingdom. Help us to take a step closer to being a servant 
and a slave to others. And we'll thank you, Lord, as you show yourself faithful once again to your children that call upon your name. We ask it in the name above every name, Jesus Christ, our example and our coming King. 